we are live. Uh, welcome to our joint committees uh, with housing under their jurisdiction, to our esteemed guests, some of whom are here to testify in person, as well as our guests on Zoom. I'm Senator Keisha Ram Hinsdale. I chair the Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs Committee. Um, I'd just like to uh, take a moment before we go into the housekeeping and let our committees introduce themselves um, to say how, uh, how important a time it is to focus on housing um, and really ground us in why we're having a hearing on housing uh, today, which I would say in my experience, we haven't done in a long time. Um, and uh, I, as we've been taking up our bill, which is you know, not very splashy, but draft 7.2 of a committee bill. Um, we've been hearing a lot of compelling testimony and stories and some facts and figures have really stood out to me. Um, and first, I think it's important to say that where we call home, who we share our home with, uh, what type of housing we live in can have such a profound impact on our lives. Um, we sit here at a time when Vermont has the uh, unfortunate uh, recognition as the state with the highest rate of homelessness growth in the country over the last couple of years. And so now the second highest rate of homelessness per capita of any state in the nation. Um, another fact that stood out to me as we've taken testimony is that 69% of Vermonters live in households of two people or less. And we know we have a lot of large uh, properties where uh, you know people actually want to downsize or have other options and that would probably be better for their agency in life and our environment. Um, we're also sitting here at a time where we're recognizing that we have a very large racial home ownership gap in Vermont, the fifth largest gap in the country um, and one that unfortunately is getting worse. In 1970, 38% of black Vermonters were homeowners and now it's 21%. So these are just some of the uh, statistics and information that I'm, I'm dwelling on as we uh, try to look to a very bold set of ideas to tackle our housing crisis. I think it's important to recognize that there is no one enemy here. There is no one cause of our housing crisis. The nation is in a housing crisis, but that means we should probably do a little bit of everything to solve it, and that's what we're gonna to attempt to do. Um, I'm really honored to be sitting next to uh, House Chair of House General and Housing, Tom Stevens. For those of you who don't know, we actually started together on the House uh, General and Housing Committee um, 14 years ago. So there are probably not uh, necessarily two people left in the building who spent a longer time on this issue than both of us. And uh, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Keisha. I was in my 40s when I started this job, and you haven't hit it yet. So, um, so um, thank you. Yes, we've been dealing with these issues for a very long time, and it's much longer than our combined service uh, to to the people of Vermont through our through our positions here. Um, I also want to make sure, though, with with all of the negative stuff and all the very difficult stuff, all the stuff that, that constitutes a crisis that that Senator Ron Hinsdale was mentioning. I'd also like to appreciate the fact that since the pandemic, with the help of federal funding and with really a unified view of what the issues are and how important they are, whether it is the racial disparity, whether it is homelessness, whether it is the unaffordability of building new houses, whether it is um, rental housing, which is in different, different states of, of livability, that we've invested well over $500 million as a state and, and with federal funds to alleviate some of the issues, whether it's um, back rent, whether it's assistance to landlords to help keep tenants and to help keep their, their mortgages up to date, uh, whether it's just really trying to invest across the state in new housing. And we've made quite a dent compared to where we were. But now we're at a point where we need to move forward and that dent needs to be a lot bigger than it is right now. And we, what, what the pandemic has shown to me is that there's a lot that we don't know, but we do know that we have to start with more housing, better rules for that housing. And we need to create tools to help people build it, whether it's private developers or whether it's our public um, nonprofit housing agencies. And so, it is 
too easy to say that there's not enough money in the world to, to solve these problems. But I think Vermonters have shown again and again in the time that we've served that we, we rise to the crisis and we try to solve the problem as best we can. And one of the best ways to do this is to have um, a public hearing like this to hear. But we know from what we've heard certain things, we want to be able to hear from Vermonters and um, hear what is going on in your lives. So thank you all for who are, who are here. Are you going to go through the three minutes and the, the length of time? I think now would be a good time to have our committee members introduce themselves so that sure. the kind of housekeeping items are fresh in people's minds. So let you start and go that way. Um, so I will start by allowing my vice chair to introduce ah, myself and uh, your Al district. <laughs> Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Ready, Barack, Franklin County. I'm Dennis Labonte, and I serve Linden, Sutton, Sheffield, Wheelock, and Newark. Ashley Bartley, Franklin 1. Uh, Chip Troiano, uh, Caledonia 2, Hardwick, Stannard, and Walden, the former vice chair of the House General Committee. I'm Joe Parsons. Um, I represent the towns of uh, Newberry, Topsom, and Groton. In Cummings, I represent the, Sen uh, the Washington Senate District. Excuse me, I'm Elizabeth Burroughs, and I represent Windsor 1, which is Heartland, West Windsor, and Windsor. I'm Mary Howard, and I represent Rutland District 6. Kathleen James, Bennington 4, which is Arlington, Manchester, Sandgate, and part of Sunderland. <laughs> Caleb Elder, Addison 4, <clears throat> Bristol, Lincoln, Moncton, and Starks. Emily Krasnow, South Burlington, Chittenden 9. Wendy Harrison, Wyndham Senate District. Saudia Lamont, and I represent Morristown, Elmore, Worcester, Woodbury, and the northern part of Stowe, and I'm on general and housing. Robin Chestnut Tangerman, uh, representing Rutland Bennington District, Middletown Springs, Paulette, Rupert, Tinmouth, and half of Wells. <laughs> and again, I'm Tom Stevens. I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Gould Score. And I'm Larry Labor. I represent Essex, <laughs> Orleans District, 12 towns. Thank you. And uh, I don't see any seats, so I don't know how to help you right now. <laughs> but, there's a spot uh, between there's a spot? Ashley okay. and the chair. So that's the witness chair. But the oh. so first item of housekeeping, that's the witness oh. chair for those who are here in person. Um, and uh, I think it's a it's a certainly a good problem to have that we're here at capacity. He's on the committee. Mm -hmm. um, yes, if you wanted to move forward, you can. And among <coughs> esteemed guests, I know we have other senators and other House members um, here. Uh, and, and the next generation um, to to be part of this hearing. So this is an important topic to those beyond our committees as well. Um, so now on to some of the housekeeping items. Everyone, um, at least here present ha in, on the committees, has the list of witnesses. It may go a little bit out of order. Uh, Scott's keeping me informed about who might be late or canceled last minute. Um, that is the witness chair there. And uh, we'll call, we'll try to let people know if they're on deck, either the next to speak or the person after that. Um, we're here at a public hearing related to housing in general. We've allowed people to sign up by generalized topics, and we won't make too big of a deal about that. Most people signed up under affordable and fair housing, <laughs> um, and but we'll let people know that we jumped to a new set of topics. Um, we have draft 7.2 of our committee bill in Senate Economic Development and Housing. Many people uh, are commenting as well on things like H68, which is a house bill that has some zoning and regulatory provisions, H111 uh, coming from the Rural Caucus on rural housing needs, and general topics related to housing since it's a major priority in the legislature uh, this session. Um, so we've just done introductions, and uh, we're here in room 267 of the pavilion. We have some people joining by Zoom. This is being live streamed on uh, the Senate Economic Development YouTube channel. Uh, those who are joining remotely will hopefully notice you can see and hear everything going on in the room, but you yourself cannot control your video or audio for now. 
Um, we are really appreciative of our staff who are making this run smoothly and trying to offer full transparency and ease to those who want to testify. Um, and at least those who are here by Zoom will be able to see the list of speakers as well in your chat box. So you can perhaps uh, do other things while listening and knowing where you are generally in the order. Um, I'll call out the names of the person up next and on deck. Uh, and when I call your name, our committee assistant will promote you from being an attendee to a panelist. Uh, you may need to, to adjust your video and audio uh, as you become a panelist from an attendee. Um, and once you are oriented and begin to speak, that's when the three minute timer will start. Um, we appreciate people sticking with the allotted time so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. And the timer will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining. It turns red when your time is up. And I will politely ask that we move on to the next person at that time. Um, and once your time is complete, you'll be moved back to the, the attendee area where you can continue watching if you would like, or you can exit altogether. Uh, we just ask you speak clearly and respectfully any inappropriate banners, background images, vulgar or inappropriate language will be cause for immediate dismissal from the hearing. If you have any technical trouble, please use the chat function and uh, our support staff will be there to help you. Um, the chat is disabled in terms of using it for promoting your position or other talking points um, and is there for logistical help. And if you have logistical help, uh, issues, or you somehow lose your spot, we will try our best to return to you toward the end of the program. Um, when your time is up, we'll give you a moment to finish your sentence. And uh, we hope that you'll keep in mind respectfully that others uh, need to testify as well. And we have all had a long day in the <laughs> legislature and uh, wanna finish as promptly as we can. We hope this public hearing serves as a useful platform for Vermonters uh, and everyone present today to voice their opinions to us in a respectful and effective way. And with that, let's please get started. Um, the first witness on our list is here in person, Emily Rosenbaum of Stowe. And while she's coming forward, next is Michael Messier of Rutland and Elise Shanbacker of Regents, who are both on Zoom. Emily. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, I, full disclosure, I am the president of the Rural Community Transportation Board. I am not speaking on behalf of RCT. I am also the initiative director for the Lamoille Working Communities Challenge, and I am here in that capacity tonight. Um, I'm here to say that we cannot talk about housing without talking about transportation, and we cannot talk about transportation without talking about housing. We have transportation deserts in our rural communities. And I'm going to give you an example from Lamoille, although I'm sure all of those of you who serve in our rural communities can think of examples in your own communities. My example is that we have fantastic public transportation for commuting purposes in Stowe and Morrisville. We also have that in Cambridge, although it is facing outside of our county and facing towards Chittenden. Meanwhile, the other parts of our county don't have that kind of transportation. I'm thinking of a specific uh, transportation de desert, which is Johnson. While Johnson is on a floodplain, it does have a lot of places that could be developed into housing, and they want more housing that people can afford. Morrisville has been building tremendously and can only take so much more. Stowe has very expensive housing. Johnson wants to be part of our housing solution. However, we do not have transportation for commuting purposes in Johnson. So why I'm here today is to say to you, please think holistically about developing housing and transportation together. A very wise member of one of your committees continually tells me that it is all connected. Until we commit as a state to bringing reliable public transportation for commuting purposes, to our rural communities, we will be unable to develop the town centers that have so much potential for housing. And I'm talking town centers. We need to embrace innovative solutions statewide like microtransit and e-bikes. So again, I urge you to take a holistic approach. I thank you for listening today because we cannot talk about housing without talking about transportation. And we cannot talk about transportation without talking about housing. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. So I may have mispronounced our next guest's name. It might be Michelle Messier. Um, 
Michelle. 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 Um, from Rutland. Hopefully is on Zoom, then Elise Shanbecker and back in person to Colby Lynch from Barry. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this evening's hearing. I'm a 16th generation Vermonter. I attended the University of Vermont St. Michael's College. I've been a property owner in and around Rutland uh, for 35 plus years. I've been frustrated by the state of Vermont and the VHSA rental assistance program. I had a tenant that uh, his rent was paid through November, actually tenants plural, through November of 2020 and have not received anything yet for two years. It's created substantial issues. Um, the reason being is that the tenant that occupied the dwelling would not complete the software application and or the hard copy applications that were provided to us. It's resulted in credit rating issues for us. We know that oh, approximately 15,000 other landlords have been uh, satisfied through this process. I just heard that there's $500 million that is available. For some reason, we're having issues at getting this through the system. So I look forward to resolution of these issues before I have to take action. And that action would be filing a lawsuit in regard to a temporary takings of our property and uh, non-equal protection under the law. While I'm here, you know, when you turn on the benefits, if you build it, they will come. So I believe that a lot of people are coming to the state of Vermont for the benefits, but we don't have the infrastructure to support the benefits that are there. In other words, the housing, the infrastructure and other things. FYI, I also ran for mayor of Rutland. Our property tax rate in the city of Rutland is 3.6%, one of the highest in the country. As a landlord that does most of his own work, I cannot afford to make a two family work in Rutland anymore. And I've owned it for one of them for 33 years. It's disappointing to me. Um, I look forward to working with the state of Vermont to find some resolutions. I appreciate the panel listening to our comments and concerns. And in regard to the tenant, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. If they don't complete the software application, they don't do the hard copy. What are your rights under a non-eviction moratorium that was implemented by the United States government under the COVID CARES Act that the state of Vermont received? I've been in contact with a lawyer. I've been in contact with the state of Vermont's lawyer. I've been in contact with, I believe it's uh, Ms. Kathleen Burke, uh, the director. And so once again, I look forward to your committee's participation and understanding that it's becoming increasingly frustrated for small landlords to basically economically be able to provide housing to those that are less fortunate. I've been a participant in the Section 8 program for a number of years. The housing has met the Section 8 standards. So we're just looking to be compensated. And the total amount that we're due by way of back rents is $30,000. And we have a couple of children that are in college and we have other financial obligations. And it does make it difficult. Thanks again. Um, we should have the cowbell as the Vermont State Instrument. That's my part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that for next time. Thank you, Mr. Messier. Uh, next is Elise Schenbecker, followed in person by Colby Lynch. For those of you following along, Jessica Laporte is running late, so we'll put her later in the program. And so Buster Caswell is on she deck. She, oh, she is here. Okay, great. So first we'll go to Elise Schenbecker. Hi there. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit backlit. Um, my name is Elise Chanbacker. I'm the executive director of the Addison County Community Trust. Um, first, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and recognizing the paramount importance of addressing the housing crisis to the future of Vermont. Um, I'm mainly here to ask that the legislature support the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board at the full statutory amount of $27.8 million in fiscal year 24. This funding is critical to ensuring that ACCT and organizations like us can continue to deliver on our mission of providing safe, decent, and affordable housing, along with the supports and services residents need to be successful. ACCT has been putting VHCB dollars to work since 1989 in 14 of the 23 towns in Addison County. We provide affordable housing for over 1,000 residents who live in our soon to be 354 apartments, 340 mobile home lots, and 75 permanently affordable single family homes. 
With the support of VHCB, ACCT has brought over 100 new homes and tens of millions of dollars in investment into Addison County since 2005. Even so, the vacancy rate in our area is still below 1%, and nearly half the renters who live here pay more than a third of their incomes in rent. We have more work to do. Some of our recent successes include developments like McKnight Lane and Waltham, a net zero community helping us meet our dual climate and housing goals. ACCT worked closely with the town of Waltham, population 446, to redevelop a blighted mobile home park and provide affordable and workforce housing for their community. BHCB is also a critical funder of firehouse apartments, which to my knowledge is the only new rental housing under development in Addison County. BHCB provided an initial investment of 1.6 million, and when costs skyrocketed heading into construction, BHCB was there with a $1.3 million supplemental ARPA award to get the project done. When it's complete later this year, it'll be home to 20 families, individuals, and seniors, including at least four formerly homeless households through a coordinated entry partnership with local service providers. These households won't have to worry about their rent skyrocketing or their heating bills being unaffordable, and they will have access to ongoing services to help keep them stably and successfully housed, avoiding the cycle of eviction and poverty experienced by too many Vermonters. Finally, I wanna mention manufactured housing communities or MHCs, which are also at the forefront of the environmental justice movement in Vermont. MHCs were historically constructed on poor and marginal land, often with significant flood risk and serve some of our most remote, remote vulnerable communities. ACCT has three parks in Starksboro, for example, that comprise one in five housing units in that community. We've not traditionally had access to the same funding opportunities as rental housing, but in the last two years, VHCB and other funders have made funding MHC improvements a top priority. Thanks to these efforts, we've leveraged millions of dollars, including ARPA um, and USDA rural development funding to in reinvest in the infrastructure of these parks to make sure that they can be successful for years to come. Now is not the time to back off the throttle on VHCB funding so we can continue doing these important projects. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ms. Schambecker. Perfect. Yes. Um, next is Colby Lynch of Barry here in person. And next after that is Jessica Laporte and Buster Caswell. Okay. Hi, my name is Colby Lynch and I currently live at the Quality Inn in Barry. First, I'd like to give a bit of background information on how exactly my partner and I found ourselves living in a hotel room. When the pandemic began, we were both home care providers. Tyler had been working with an agency out of Moortown for over a decade. He was great at the job of caregiving, and I was relatively new, though my background as a single parent prepared me well. All was going smoothly with work. However, our living situation became a precarious one. The owner of the house we were renting to the tune of $1,600 per month had plans to sell the property and needed to fix it up. I was hoping that we could stay here, stay there during this transition, but that was not the case. We had been given a notice to vacate within three months. At the time, we didn't really think it was that big of a deal other than the arduous task of moving our belongings during mud season. We secured a room through Front Porch Forum and moved in at the beginning of May, 2021. Despite our desire to make the living situation work, we recognized that we had to leave what had become an unhealthy living situation. By that time, it was the height of the housing crisis and there were no options available, no matter how much money you made. So we found ourselves living in our van. When you are living in a vehicle and the temperatures are getting down to 28 degrees, it is a life-changing experience. One I still have not fully recovered from. We moved into a hotel room on November 4th, 2020, 2021. We were glad, just glad to be somewhere warm and not living in our vehicles. But I wanna stress the reality that motel rooms are for vacations or weekend excursions, not everyday life. I could go on, but my main message is this. If there were housing units available, then we would be in one right now. Vermont has no housing safety net. We had to switch careers because if we make even $60 more than we currently make at low wage jobs, we would not be able to stay at the hotel. But this is a chicken and egg situation. Even if we find housing, we have to show that we can afford it. But we can't secure more lucrative income sources because if we do, we are kicked out of our current situation and would be homeless again. We see signs that everywhere is hiring, but having no homes available to rent is impacting folks' ability to apply for these jobs. 
If this great need for unavailable housing persists, Vermont will lose a lot of good workers. It is comforting to know that there, there are those who hold public office that do truly care. That being said, I shouldn't have to feel like I'm violating community standards just by simply existing. These days, the weariness of this situation has my spirits draining rapidly. I know that I'm a physically and mentally strong individual capable of a lot of good. I'm a mother to a grown boy, a visionary artist, and a worthy confidant. I enjoy a good laugh even at the expense of myself, but having no place to live is no <coughs> laughing matter. The debasing stereotypes towards a homeless need to be eradicated from public dissent. Perhaps the day will come when I can look back and chuckle at the desperation behind emptying my middle-aged bladder into a Fahe yogurt container in the dead of the early morning, freezing my behind off in the car because a water pump in the van went out again, or waiting in, in anticipation for the dreaded cop knock on the van window, assaulting my precious sleep just to make sure everything is okay. A day will come when I'm able to stretch out on my own couch again and have access to a table to do my art in my own space or cook in my own kitchen so I can entertain friends and family at my dinner table. A situation like this can be debasing and destabilizing. I'm thankful that I can choose for it not to be demoralizing. I have made a few friends at the motel. Grit and candor and I like to think wisdom has pulled me through this experience thus far. I only wish to use my testimony as a way of addressing the issues, acting, and moving forward. The words of Eleanor Roosevelt have become clear to me in these chaotic times. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. I will end on this note. Thanks so much, Ms. Lynch. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jessica Laporte of Duxbury on Zoom, and on deck is Buster Caswell and then Nancy Snyder. You're muted, Jess. <laughs> there you go. Hi. Um, I, my vehicle has stopped, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was unable to make it home, and I heard you were going to call my name, so I pulled over. Um, I do just want to take a moment to appreciate the both the gravity and, unfortunately, how common situations like the person before me are. Um, I know that that brought emotion up in me in understanding the humanity of the people that we share this state with. Um, I'm calling in as a member of the public, but also as a member of the Land Access and Opportunity Board, um, a board created in the last biennium um, to address uh, housing equity issues and land access issues um, for protected classes in Vermont. Um, as I think about um, my ask of legislators, I feel continually confused of how to collaborate with you all as an active member of the public, as somebody who has testified on behalf of a number of issues, and as somebody who is experiencing the intersections of marginalization in our, in our state. Um, but as a member of the Land Access and Opportunity Board, I want to choose to put energy into that space, because I believe it's a powerful piece of legislation that is creating an opportunity for collaboration across departments and with legislators, and most importantly, with the public to solve our solve housing crisis issues, to, to engage in housing and land access from an equity um, framework. Uh, the Land Access and Opportunity Board was created in Act 182 in Section 22, if you're not familiar with it. And we are just released our Sunrise Report yesterday. Um, we are uh, housed under the VHCB. And we, I'm calling in today to ask and to advocate for um, a minimum appropriation of around $1.2 annually. And we would really like to ask the legislature and um, the relevant committees and uh, the appropriations board, I don't even know how all this <laughs> functions, um, for um, multi-year funding for about 4.8 million. I'm asking for that number as a member of the board, understanding that our annual 1.2 million, if we have to come back and advocate for it every single year, will not allow us to, to both recruit and retain 
the talented staff that we need to make this work effective. Um, one of our main uh, charges is not just to potentially have our own programming and granting, but to actually have advisory powers over a number of state in, uh, institutions. And we believe that by empowering the LAOB to do its work, you all will actually be empowering greater efficiency across departments that will allow for more effective equity strategies because right now, from where I stand, in the experience of community organizers trying to create access to these um, programs, there are many, many folks falling through the gaps and that these programs are not right size for. And even when we band together to try to access low interest loans or other, other forms of services, we often are still denied. So we would really like to have a concentrated strategic effort to make these more effective programs through the LAOB. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Next is Buster Caswell on Zoom, followed by Nancy Snyder and Hawa Adan. Buster Caswell of Milton. <clears throat> Oh, in person? No, he's in person. Oh, he is? Okay. He's coming through. Okay. <laughs> uh, digital switch. Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, I didn't think I was. Good. They can see that like another person. Oh, they can. Okay. <laughs> it's very fancy. <clears throat> Hello? Hi. Hello. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, leaders, for your valuable time listening uh, to the public. I applaud the speaker before me. Um, uh, very valuable um, uh, testimony there. Um, farm workers, um, symbol setting on top of the capital um, is agriculture. It sits on a dome, that dome sits on a home and we need to address the home of farm worker housing. There are 2.6 million farm workers in the United States. Agriculture in the United States and Vermont is a thriving industry that provides 1.3 trillion in economic impact and provides food for 33, 336 million citizens and beyond. Farm workers provide all Americans with access to self, safe, healthy, affordable food. Farm workers are the critical first step in our food supply chain. Farm workers are always essential and their contributions to the food we purchase often go unseen. Farm workers provide highly skilled and often physically and mentally challenged labor that is often taken for granted. And farm workers contribute their work to meet and exceed the challenges of mother nature to perform under extreme pressures through the pandemic that we all face and other global challenges. Farm workers need a home and agriculture is thriving in our rural economies, in our rural economies. And our farm workers need housing because our agriculture depends on it. And we must build homes off the farms for our farm workers. We must build and continue to build homes on the farms, give our farmers the support and technical support and funding necessary to do so. And we also need to continue the ongoing work of the farm worker repair program that had begun last year. We must commit funds fully to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. We also must support the Vermont 
affordable housing coalition's goals and the Vermont Housing Coalition's coalition's goals in meeting all the needs of the housing. Thanks housing so much. Housing and agriculture. Kessler. Yes, I thank you for your value. Oh, <laughs> that's sad. But I understand. Thank you, Mike. Um, next in person, we have Nancy Snyder of Burlington and Hawa Adan if they come. Otherwise, we'll move to Cindy Reed and then Michelle Kersey. It's difficult to talk with all of you because you're. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am talking with all of you. <laughs> Thank you for having me and thank you for all the good work you are doing in these committees for the people of Vermont. I really appreciate your efforts and I've already learned a great deal just with the first few speakers. My name is Nancy Snyder. I live in downtown Burlington in a cathedral square community called Juniper House. I want to talk to you about affordable housing in Vermont, but specifically senior housing and my experience with the nonprofit Cathedral Square. When I retired five years ago, this is a good story, by the way. <laughs> when I retired five years ago, it was clear that I wanted to live in Burlington. My two married children and five wonderful grandchildren live near and around Burlington. It is a vibrant city with accessible health care and public transportation. And so I began an intensive search for an apartment that suited the needs of a single senior woman. Even five years ago, rents were very high and inventory was very low. <laughs> I almost gave up. <clears throat> then a friend told me about Cathedral Square. I immediately sent in an application. I waited two and one half years, two and one half years for an opening and was finally offered an apartment just two years ago today. It was during COVID and I signed the lease sight unseen. I couldn't have a tour of the facility. <clears throat> I am very fortunate today to live in a modern building with amenities like an in-house gym, recreation activities, an in-house property manager, and all kinds of activities planned for our recreation in a prime location near all the services I need. I am so grateful, Cathedral Square. I feel safe and comfortable and I live a good life. I also serve on the board of directors of Cathedral Square. So I wanna share some numbers with you. Today, there are about 1,300 applicants waiting for a senior apartment. They are all qualified and all deserving. They also will wait two to five years to get um, an apartment. Meanwhile, Cathedral Square has 27 <coughs> housing opportunities in and around Burlington. They're very successful at building and managing senior housing. We're working on it to get more housing. Please fully fund the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and please be generous. We all know there's a housing crisis in our state. If we can house those 13 people waiting for an apartment, it would free up their homes and provide housing for young families, a win for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we don't have Hawa right now. We'll hopefully return if, to them. Uh, but Cindy Reed of South Burlington, you are up. And then we have Michelle Kersey and Jackie Wagner. Great, thank you. Hello, I'm Cindy Reed. Um, nice um, setup for me, Nancy, thank you. I'm the Director of Housing Development at Cathedral Square. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, Square is a nonprofit affordable senior housing and services provider, and thank you for this opportunity tonight. I've been developing housing for 10 years at Cathedral Square. During this time, I've witnessed the need for affordable housing increase exponentially, and I've also witnessed the transformative nature of affordable housing with on-site services in the lives of low, lower income older adults. It's imperative that we continue to invest in affordable housing for our increasingly older population. Cathedral Square has about 1,200 people on its wait list for independent living and assisted living. In October, we opened a 30-unit housing community in rural South Hero called Bayview Crossing, which quickly leased up and already has 89 people on the wait list. Some residents came from housing insecurity. Some residents sold their homes to move to Bayview, opening up housing for working families. All of these seniors moved into Bayview Crossing because they needed safe, appropriate housing with SASH support and services at home on site. What has happened for residents of Baby Crossing since they moved in? Through SASH, we have provided individualized care coordination and one-on-one -on -one wellness assessments with our wellness nurse. We've offered programs like Tai Chi, exercise, wellness nurse presentations, blood pressure checks, TED Talks, access to transportation, access to food security programs like group and congregate meals, commodity boxes, local food shelf, those have all taken off. Our partnership with the local nonprofit CIDR has enhanced what we can accomplish through SASH, in particular with transportation, meals, and wellness programs. The combination of affordable housing and on-site SASH services to help older adults not just help older adults not just thrive, not just exist, but thrive. We need to do more for the people on our wait list and for older adults all over the state. Funding for Vermont Housing and Conservation Board at the statutory level of 27.8 million approximately is a critical step in making it possible to develop more housing like Bayview Crossing in South Hero and Juniper House in Burlington. We could not have developed those communities without VHCB funding. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet with you tonight to underscore the critical need for more affordable housing and for your incredible service to Vermont communities all over the state. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. So next we have Michelle Kersey of Plainfield in person. And if we don't get Jackie Wagner on, then Catherine Molosik just after that. Hi, um, thank you all for holding this hearing tonight. I'm a resident of Plainfield and I'm chair of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Vermont's housing crisis has been decades in the making. Even before the pandemic, we were hearing from our members of the coalition about long wait lists for their apartments. And from my own personal experience searching for an apartment in central Vermont a few months ago, I can tell you that it is a race to be the first person to reach out to a landlord when an apartment becomes available, a game of hitting the refresh button on your web browser every 15 minutes as you search Craigslist. Um, the ongoing negative impacts of um, well-intentioned legislation and local zoning regulations with unintended consequences paired with consistent underinvestment of public dollars have contributed to our housing shortage. And people with low incomes, black, indigenous, and people of color, older community members, and people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by the current shortage. Just as it has taken decades to get to this point, it will take us years to make things right. But there's a good place to start, and that's by fully funding Vermont Housing and Conservation Board at the full statutory level of 50% of the property transfer tax revenue. Um, it's estimated that, that if VHCB had been funded fully over the last decade, it would have resulted in the creation of another 1,000 units of affordable housing. Fully funding VHCB won't be enough. We must continue to invest at accelerated rates to create the housing necessary to fix what the market will not correct on its own. Substantial capital investments in emergency shelters, new affordable housing, and the preservation of existing affordable housing is essential. VAHC calls for a combined level of capital investment totaling $215 million between the Budget Adjustment Act and the fiscal year 24 budget. We also support increasing funding for rental assistance programs, including the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program and the Home Voucher Program, as well as funding to expand both the SASH for All Program and the Family Supportive Housing Program. At the same time, we must remove barriers that developers face when creating the housing that our communities so desperately need. 
We applaud the work currently being done in the legislature to address these issues. We also need to protect community members who are most adversely affected by the shortage of housing in Vermont. Renter protections are necessary, but we need to be sure that any safeguards we put in place do not result in unintended negative consequences for those renters. We can learn from the protections put in place in other areas of the country, and we call on the legislature to commission a study performed by an independent group to explore renter protections such as just cause eviction and rent increase caps. Thank you all so much for your hard work and your dedication to the people of Vermont and to solving the housing crisis. Thank you. So if we don't have Jackie Wagner, we don't. We'll move on to Catherine Malosic of Wilder on Zoom. And then after that is John Hafner of Hartford here. Uh, hi, my name, I'm trying to get my video to show. Uh, let's see. My name is Kathy, Mel there I am. My I name is Kathy Melisic. I live in Wilder, Vermont, um, which is one of the five villages of Hartford, Vermont. Um, I grew up in Rutland Town and I went to school with Messiers back in the day. So I instantly recognized that name earlier in this meeting. Um, Wilder is one of five villages in the town of Hartford. You might know our town's other villages better, White River Junction and Queechy. Um, I'm using Wilder as an example of what I hope we can address along with affordable housing in uh, something we've always promoted um, in this work for uh, the housing problems in the, in the state right now. Um, we're reportedly the first planned worker community in the state, having been gridded and designed for workers at the mill near the Wilder Dam on the Connecticut River. We have a quote, remarkably intact historic center. We are a compact neighborhood of humble homes, a way of saying many, including mine, are historic fixer uppers on small lots. We have for more than a hundred years been the kind of neighborhood that developers and town planners are trying to recreate now. I will follow up with a my testimony with a written piece to the committee, but I wanted to put a voice to what we've experienced in Wilder and Hartford overall. And having been a renter for many years, I understand the, the powerlessness that often goes along with that when it comes to landlords. Um, we're surrounded by gold towns, including Norwich, Woodstock, Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire, just across the street from us, and Hartford have by far borne the brunt of development since I moved here 23 years ago. Uh, we've also borne the brunt of working to shelter the unhoused or those at risk of homelessness, something that we promote at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, but often at the risk of slander, fights by developers, uh, board members, many of whose people, directors and staff do not live in Hartford. Um, from a layperson's point of view, um, and having participated in town planning, I can tell you what I've seen happen around here. We've all uh, heard of people recently given sudden notice of eviction. This has happened because of Northern Stage and White River Junction by MG2 in Queechee and Heartland, by Growth Cap Management, what a name, just across the bridge in Lebanon. Uh, that particular eviction included a veteran who was given notice of eviction on Veterans Day. We're under incredible pressure from developers, nonprofit and otherwise, and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing neighborhoods disappear. Uh, we have tried to get help from the Division of Historic Preservation to work with us and developers that has not necessarily been successful. As with the woman from Stowe, I agree that we need a holistic consideration of the housing issue, addressing the increasingly large income gap between the haves and the have nots and all that goes along with that, such as broadband and uh, transportation. I read a quote from private equity investor once that affordable housing is considered a relatively safe investment because the demand is only expected to go up. And I think that's wrong. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kathy. Next is John Hafner from Hartford here in person. And after that, Angela Harbin and Cindy Zook on Zoom. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Ron Hinsdale and uh, the committee here as well. Uh, I'm John Hafner, I'm from White River Junction. Uh, I'm also a housing and transportation program manager at Vital Communities. Vital Communities cultivates the civic, environmental, and economic vitality of the Upper Valley, a region that we call uh, 69 towns spanning the Connecticut River. Our housing program stewards a network of business, municipal, nonprofit, and community leaders focused on meeting the Upper Valley's workforce housing needs. 
As part of that, over the past few months, our organization has conducted extensive community engagement to try and understand what issues are most acute for the people in our region. And repeatedly, our communities are saying that the number one issue is housing. Um, comments have ranged from the personnel, like lifelong residents not being able to age in place, as we've often heard today because of the uh, lack of appropriate housing, to the institutional, like our major health care provider in our region not being able to hire medical staff um, because there is no housing for their workforce. And whether these issues are personal or institutional, they are existential and they threaten the vitality of our communities in the Upper Valley. So I applaud you all for doing the legislative work to try and address this issue. Um, the, the draft bills that are currently working their way through both the Senate and House, I think are, are immensely needed. And just wanted to uh, point to a few things that I uh, uh, have drawn out as I think important and, and should be uh, commented on. So the attention to comprehensive land use reform and the focus on density is critical. So that, that is is a huge step forward. I think specifically emphasizing housing over parking lots is, is immensely important. And I would say you could even go even further and just uh, abolish minimum parking standards. Um, modernizing Act 250 to support incremental development that actually preserves our natural resources instead of encouraging sprawl is absolutely necessary. Focusing on our, uh, um, our downtown cores and our village centers. Uh, moreover, I want to applaud you for continuing appropriations to establish uh, pro to established programs and agencies like the Vermont Rental Housing Improvement Program and um, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And I echo recommendations that this board should be fully funded to its 27.8 million um, statutory level. And these are all holding the ground against this housing, this mounting crisis. So additionally, I want to applaud the uh, experimenting with innovative programs that support manufactured housing investment, missing middle income homeowners ownership, employer-sponsored housing, uh, and funding resource navigators to help our communities access the once-in-a-generation funding that is coming through the federal level. This funding has been propping up um, um, efforts like transportation that are now losing funding and, and struggling to connect to the uh, additional funding that's needed. So fully resourcing um, <coughs> positions to help connect communities to the, the funding that is out there is also critical. Um, all of these things are helpful to to the cause of providing a safe and affordable home for everyone. And um, so just have to ask, can there be more? Um, can the draft legislation go beyond what's next? And more importantly, what can we all do to help? So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, hopefully Angela Harbin of Tunbridge on Zoom. Who's on deck? On deck is Cindy Zoom. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so good evening. I'm Angie Harbin. I do live in Tunbridge, but I'm here tonight as the Executive Director of Downstreet Housing and Community Development. We serve Central Vermont. I echo the appreciation that's been shared tonight already for the committee's investment in understanding the state of housing in Vermont. Um, there are so many things I could share about housing needs in the state and the county served by Downstreet, but with only three minutes, I'm going to whittle it down to the simplest components. We need a lot more permanently affordable housing. We need to preserve existing affordable housing so we are not losing ground while we build new. And we need to assume the responsibility of ensuring that people can sleep indoors while we work to solve a housing problem that they didn't create. Uh, so I think we all know that we need enough of the full spectrum of homes, you know, from emergency shelter to market rate home ownership so that we can meet the housing needs of all Vermonters. Uh, some well-informed estimates are saying that it will take up to 40,000 more year-round homes across the state to meet this need by 2030. That's a daunting number. And, and we know that our lower and moderate income residents are at the highest risk of cost burden, displacement, or even homelessness. So while we're determinedly bolstering the state's stock through multiple creative and innovative initiatives, we need to be sure that we are intentionally providing adequate funding and enacting the inclusionary zoning practices that will allow us to create and preserve the permanently affordable homes that are a critical part of reducing homelessness, of stabilizing vulnerable families, and of creating more vibrant and equitable communities. Permanent affordable housing also is also necessary to retain Vermont employers and sustain our ability to access essential services. Workers need an affordable place to live. 
So achieving this by making an, an investment in permanently affordable housing means that beneficiaries of these public dollars are consistently the people who need it most. So I ask that you please fully fund the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board at the full statutory level as a first step in ensuring that we have enough affordable homes. And right now, um, in our community right now, there are people experiencing homelessness in part because we haven't made these investments in ensuring that Vermont has enough affordable homes. And that's on us. I mean, housing is a basic human right. In a just society, access is not predicated on market forces or one's health status or their ability to earn sufficient income. I'm the first to also add that housing is complicated and I'm very thankful tonight, to tonight's other presenters that will talk about some of those complexities, including community and housing service needs. But as you're making hard choices about what to fund, I ask that you please consider what it says about us as a state and as people, if we choose not to ensure that members of our community have access to shelter, while also investing in our future and, and investing in the homes they deserve by addressing our permanent housing shortage. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Um, next is Cindy Zook on Zoom and Will Eberly in person if he's here. I don't currently see him. Not here. Not here. Okay, Cindy. Hi, thank you very much for uh, starting this this evening. This is really important. My name is Cindy Zook, and I am a SASH coordinator at Thayer House in Burlington's New North End. Uh, Thayer House is a Cathedral Square property and contains 70 of the over 1,000 apartments that Cathedral Square has developed across three counties for older adults and those with disabilities. Even with those apartments perpetually affordable for the future, we have over 1,300 people on the waiting list, as you have heard before. And uh, over 200 people are waiting to get into their house alone at this time. The average wait is three to five years. I am asking you this evening to please consider to make more funding available for perpetually affordable age specific housing. Please make it a priority for your session. Sometimes I don't think people realize that when elder uh, low income elder housing is developed, there's often a sunset clause and eventually those affordable units can be raised to market rates. Um, Cathedral Square sees people uh, having to flee from those buildings after the rents go up to come onto the Cathedral Square lists. A large number of our residents are Vermonters who have planned their entire lives. They have followed the three-legged stool rule of retirement. They have their $1,200, $1,300 dollars a month for their social security. They have their little pension of 200 or $300 a month from working at the hospital or working at the city clerk's office. They sold their little house for not very much because of the maintenance had gotten so bad. And now in their 70s and 80s and 90s, they have no place to go and live in the community that they have lived in their entire lives. The skyrocketing costs of living in Vermont cities is something that they never imagined. And there is a role for government here to help level that playing field for those folks who brought success to our communities. Families are trying to help, but there is certainly not much inherited wealth here for these folks. And as individuals try to maintain their health insurance and live a life, they quickly fall into deeper poverty that will certainly take more state money and more social work to extricate them from. Um, it is important to keep people in their communities. It allows their children, friends, and churches and other support systems to come to their aid. For the foreseeable future, it is going to be a challenge to find the many health care aides and social workers to help care for our older Vermonters. They need to stay near support. The hiring crisis is real. So please consider making this investment now and support the older Vermonters dream that if you work hard and you have your little savings and you sell your little house to a young family that is starting, that you you can make a lateral move to a safe, affordable place where we can support people. We want to support the circle of life and not a cycle of poverty. And I thank you very much for taking the time and holding this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Seth. So next, as I understand it, we have Marion Leakey and Margaret Anderson, both of South Hero. They both live in the same community, so we might have them in succession or together. And that's if we'll... Hi. <laughs> Is that Marion and Margaret? Yes. 
Great. Well, uh, I suppose collectively you have six minutes. Um, so however you want to divide that up is fine with us. My name is Mary Leakey. I'm 85 years old and I live in South Hero in Cathedral Square Park in Tobago. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about housing. I am a few lucky ones. I have found housing in my own town at the time I really needed it. I have lived for 37 years in South Hero in a three bedroom home, a little over two acres. I kept up with it pretty well. I could cut the grass on my tractor. I couldn't use a bush mower for the weed whacker. Our house maintenance issues became harder and harder. Finally, health problems with my back and shoulders made me realize it was time to leave my home that I loved. But I wanted to stay independent and stay in South Hero. My hometown is my longtime friends. Again, I was lucky and my timing was right. Cathedral Square was building an affordable housing community for older adults right here in South Hero. My son helped me fill out the application and mine was the first application submitted to Cathedral Square. There were well over 100 applicants for 30 apartments. I moved in just this past October. It is hard to leave your home for 37 years. I cried about it, but I arranged my new apartment so that the furniture is like it was in my old house. And now I feel like I've come to closure with the change. And I really like it here, and my home became available to a needy family. I participate in a lot of events that happen here at Bayview. I walk regularly, I meet new friends, I helped teaching a girl how to knit. Um, we made Valentine cookies and cards. I just signed up for SASH, so I will support from, from the staff here with my help and Bobby. In fact, my SASH coordinator, Paul, has helped me so I can talk to you right now. My message to you all, please make affordable housing to priority to all ages so that it is only, not only a few ones. Like that, that they housing that they didn't have an opportunity for me. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> this is Meg Anderson. Hi, Meg. Hi, my name is Meggie Anderson, and I'm a resident of Cathedral Square's new senior housing development in South Hero, also Bayview Crossing. And here's my story. I was raised in Southern Connecticut, then raised my own family in Southern Vermont. My husband and I grew a one bedroom ranch to a four bedroom, two bet home on his ancestral land in Williamsville. Our three daughters all attended public schools and then went on to college, two at UVM and one in Boston. After the kids left home, my husband and I parted ways amicably. I moved to Burlington to be near my daughters and he stayed on in the home we had built together. From 2012 to 2020, I lived at Little Eagle Bay off of North Avenue in Burlington, a peaceful rental community by the lake and on the bike path. I worked for TLC and Elder Care, Cathedral Square as a property management, and finally for KDM Guardianship Agency as an administrative assistant. In March of 2020, COVID hit and everything changed. My job with KDM ended. And at the same time, my daughter lost daycare for her one-year-old son. So in May of that year, in order to help my daughter's family and to reduce my own living expenses, I bought a small camper and parked it on their land in Fletcher. I stayed there in my camper from May to October in 2020, 21, and 22. During the cold months, I found alternate housing, first with HomeShare Vermont and then in a friend's rental unit, unit in Fairfax. All in all, I moved seven times in three years. Let me tell you, it was exhausting. However, if I had to do it all over again, I most certainly would. For the simple and all important reason that I landed here at Bayview Crossing, where my rent is affordable, the community is respectful, caring, and kind, and I feel safe and secure knowing that I have spent my days here close to my family and in peace. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thanks so much, Meg and Marion, and thanks, Paul, also for helping facilitate. We appreciate that. Uh, next is Leo Schiff of Brattleboro. If he's here, and then Patric Patricia Tedesco is after. Hi, Leo. Um, hi, I can't see the clock, um, but um, that'll work out. Um, hi, my name's Leo Schiff, and I've lived in Brattleboro for about 40 years, and I've worked in human services for the past 30 years. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I worked for Morningside Shelter in Brattleboro for five years. And I've been with the state of Vermont working for Voc Rehab for the past 24 years. I'm currently supporting the Agency of Human Services effort to help individuals successfully transition out of the pandemic transitional motel housing. Today I'm speaking, testifying solely in my role as a board member for the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. The scarcity of safe, affordable, responsibly run housing is a huge problem in Vermont. There is no single solution. However, organizations such as the Housing Trust play an important role in the solution. The Housing Trust is able to charge much more affordable rents than most landlords. Many of their projects include subsidized units, which create affordability for more vulnerable populations. The Housing Trust also serves as a second chance landlord for individuals whose life difficulties have had a negative impact on their housing history. We've learned during the pandemic about the multiplicity of challenges vulnerable populations face and the impact of those <clears throat> challenges on the individuals and their communities. Safe, responsibly run, affordable housing provides the foundation, the platform for individuals to make changes that they need. But it takes much more than just housing to transform their lives. Many individuals will need ongoing support services in order to successfully navigate their new lives. It is important for the legislature to understand that housing needs to be paired with support services in order to complete the success. There are many different models to provide the support services such as SASH for all, case management through designated agencies, um, those kinds of things. But the point I wanna make is that support services need to be funded in addition to the support that the state offers to create new housing. In addition, I would say that the subsidies need to keep up with the, uh, with the rising cost of housing in Vermont. So to summarize, I ask the state to fund more affordable housing projects coupled with subsidies and support services. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Um, next is Patricia Tedesco. And I understand Cynthia Haviland is trying to phone in and might have some trouble. Our staff are trying to help you as well, if you can hear us. And then we have Jean Zimmerman in person. Hi, Patricia. Good evening. Hey, I just got promoted. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Patricia Tedesco. I'm a resident of Woodbury, Vermont. I am the program services manager at the Vermont Center for Independent Living. VCIL is a statewide nonprofit established in 1979 to help people with disabilities. VCIL's home access program provides housing modifications for low income Vermonters who have permanent physical disabilities so they can remain in their homes and live more independently. Our primary funding comes from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and we fully support their full funding. At the end of the narrative, which I've supplied, you will find before and after photos and stories from people who have benefited from this important program. You'll hear from Vermonters like Rodney in Franklin County who shared a story with us, quote, I had a lot of trouble getting in and out of my home because of the steps. I didn't feel safe going outside unless someone was there to help me. It was unsafe. Now that I have a ramp, I can come and go as I please. I also want to say thanks for helping me get more of my independence back. You'll find lots of stories like that and the photos in the testimony I supplied um, by email. Taking a shower or getting in, of our, in and out of our homes easily is something most of us perhaps take for granted. However, the people that we help at VCIL see this as a daily struggle. 
I think we can all agree that Vermont needs more housing. Vermont needs more affordable housing. But another consideration is Vermont needs accessible housing. Universal design for new construction would build bathrooms that everybody can use, regardless if they have a disability or a guest with a disability or they end up with a disability later on themselves. As I always tell my 90 year old parents, you need a ramp before you need a ramp. And they're finally getting one this spring. <laughs> <laughs> we receive about a dozen applications a month from people who cannot access their bathrooms or enter their homes easily. We also re receive applications from elders who have moved into brand new senior housing built with a bathtub rather than an, an accessible shower. Seems kind of a waste of money to put in a brand new tub and then we come in and put in a brand new shower. So I'm urging you consider universal design so everybody has access. For as many projects as we help with, the waiting list does not seem to diminish and the need is high throughout the state. Post COVID, we've noticed that it's been difficult to get contractors. So in some cases we have funding in place, but nobody to do the work. I appreciate all of your help. I'm urging full funding for VHCB and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much. Patricia. Thank you. So if we haven't gotten Cynthia back, um, we'll go to Jean Zimmerman in person from South Burlington. And although people have touched on homelessness and emergency shelter, these are the couple folks who've signed up specifically under that category. Hello. I'm Jean Zimmerman and I live in South Burlington. I have a master's degree in clinical mental health and addictions counseling and have worked in this field for over 20 years. Vermont is a special place. There are times when we can do both what is right and what is financially sound. I'm going to talk about the funding Vermont is receiving for both homelessness, homelessness reduction and as restitution for the crimes of the pharmaceutical companies who pushed opiates upon the American public. My husband and I have a son who decided at a young age to become a doctor. During his adolescence, he broke several bones participating in sports. This was the 90s and early 2000s, and he was prescribed opiates by the ER physicians. We doled them out as prescribed and never knew he began looking for more. He started UVM with straight A's. Fast forward, junior year. His grades slipped. In his senior year, we finally discovered he was addicted to opiates, specifically Oxycontin. So by that time, he was also using heroin. He found a local doctor who prescribed Suboxone and other medications. Our son left UVM and his dreams of being a doctor behind in 2005. <clears throat> he became off and on homeless, working odd jobs. After several years in overdoses, he woke up one night at the ER, face to face with an old friend from UVM who had become a doctor, who convinced him to go to rehab, his first of more than 12 separate rehab stays. Each time he was released after two weeks, mostly unsheltered, no job, no money, the follow-up plan to try to seek out housing and go to the local clinic for methadone or suboxone. He briefly stays in transition houses, each time asked to leave immediately at relapse. We know addiction is a relapsing and recovery disease. It can take years for sobriety to become stable, yet we send individuals with serious drug dependency to short inpatient stays. And if they are lucky enough to secure one of the few transitional housing beds, we punish them with homelessness and we relapse. Our son has a disease that began with the indiscriminate prescribing of opiates to a child. He has gone from happy with a wonderful future to ashamed, broken, and homeless. He has been viciously beaten on the street, molested, starving, freezing, and exposed out in the cold, rain, and brutal heat of summer. He is ill. His teeth are falling out. He is dying on our streets and he is not alone. Vermont can use opiates settlement and homeless, homelessness reduction funds to house those who have been most harmed by this crisis. And in doing so, we can benefit all Vermonters. We know from research that the majority of individuals who become housed recover over time, becoming more self-supporting as underlying problems and traumas are remediated ceasing to utilize so many social services and saving tax dollars. We also know that individuals who feel hopeless 
disenfranchised and desperate may resort to crimes as they view it their only option for survival. Research also tells us secure housing over time reduces antisocial behaviors, including crime. In the reduction of crime, we see improvements in our own lives. Residential and commercial thefts go down. Our neighborhoods and business districts become safer. They appear more welcoming. They encourage shopping and dining and out-of-state tourism dollars to be spent and police and criminal justice costs are reduced. Vermont is a very special place and this is our unique opportunity to improve the lives of all Vermonters. Please let us not waste it. Thank you, Jean. Thank, Thank you. you. So Martin Hahn has canceled and next is Rebecca Plummer of Montpelier. Uh, did we were able to get Cynthia Havilland. Oh, great. Okay. She's on the phone though, so I'm yes. going to use her phone. Great, Cynthia, we're glad you could join us. She's there, she's just muted. Okay, S Cynthia, if you can hear us and you're able to unmute, I'm ready to listen. Why don't we keep working on it? Um, Cynthia, we're, we're happy to come back to you whenever we can figure out the, the muting issue. Um, but we'll go to Rebecca Plummer of Montpelier. And then uh, Lisa Grenveld on deck, perhaps in person. Hey, Rebecca's coming in. Okay. Uh, Cynthia does unmute. I'll just mute her real quick and we'll put her up next. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. <clears throat> Good evening. Sorry for that delay. Uh, my name is Rebecca Plummer. I'm a lawyer at Vermont Legal Aid and I'm the director of our Medical Legal Partnership Project. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, at Vermont Legal Aid and our sister organization, Legal Services Vermont, we work with people who are being hit hardest by Vermont's housing crisis, including people going through eviction and people experiencing homelessness. I've worked most closely in recent years through a partnership with clinics providing medication assisted treatment to people with substance use disorder. These people like um, Ms. Zimmerman who just spoke a few minutes ago, her son, um, are folks who are trying to turn their lives around and need more than at any other point, a stable place to live, but instead they're often very precariously housed or experiencing homelessness. During the pandemic, Vermont's received critical federal assistance to shelter people experiencing homelessness and avoid an even greater public health crisis. But as we all know, that money is drying up. At the same time, the housing crisis has exploded. There's simply no housing to be found. Vermont led the way in keeping people experiencing homelessness safe during the pandemic. We did this reactively, but we've seen how important it is and how it helps all of us. And we have a chance now to plan and to do it better. We cannot return to unsheltered homelessness. We at Vermont Legal Aid believe as Angela Harbin of Downstreet said a little while ago that housing is a human right. The legislature is working through the Budget Adjustment Act ways to address the impending next month for people who are sheltered in motels. We appreciate this and we urge the legislature to protect as many people as possible through this fix and not let people fall through the cracks. We at Vermont Legal Aid strongly support the Bridges to Housing proposal for the future of emergency housing in Vermont that was put forth by numerous housing and homelessness advocacy organizations earlier this month, including finding alternatives, to motel-based shelter, investing in affordable housing. Um, we also support a rent rescue program and other measures to prevent evictions that in an, a housing market with no vacancies, 
are a direct vector of homelessness. I wanna just say for a moment that the um, proposal by this coalition to fully fund and re-envision the GA emergency housing program is really critical. This administration has repeatedly expressed a desire to end the GA program and has not put forth a plan for emergency housing beyond the federal funding we have now. As we work with people who are experiencing homelessness and in danger of becoming homeless, we feel a shocking disconnect here. Yes, investing in housing is essential and urgently needed, but we can't pretend that this will happen quickly or that it will end homelessness completely. We'll continue to have people who need emergency housing and we need a robust, humane emergency housing program for our neighbors who find themselves in these situations that protects them when they need a safe place to stay and helps them to find new permanent housing as soon as possible. Now is the time to create that, this program. Thank you very much for your time and your work for Vermonters. Thank you, Ms. Plummer. So we are switching gears to zoning and regulatory reform more formally. And uh, I don't know if Lisa is here. I'm here. Oh, great. OK, I didn't see you by. So, uh, Lisa Grenveld of South Burlington is up, followed by Peter Plumo of South Burlington. This chair is like a throne. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank Thanks, you sir. for hearing us tonight. We really appreciate that. My name is uh, Lisa Gruneveld. I'm a Barry native and a resident of South Burlington. I am also the co-founder and vice chair of the board of OnLogic. We are a computer hardware company located in South Burlington with offices in the Netherlands, Taiwan, Malaysia, and North Carolina. Um, living close to where we work improves our quality of life and it preserves our environment. But purchasing or renting a home in many Vermont communities has become increasingly difficult and in many cases prohibitively expensive. So I talked to my team and I said, I'm going to go down to Montpelier. What would you like me to say? Um, and so here are their stories in their own words. And of course, I'm talking about our employees who are by and large middle income folks. Derek Fanton, our communications manager, and his wife both work in South Burlington. Um, but they purchased a condo in Milton five years ago, and now they commute. They spent a year actively shopping for a property in South Burlington and ended up choosing Milton only after carefully considering a possible move to North Carolina because they couldn't find anything affordable next to their offices. Derek wants you to know that he appreciates the state weighing in on issues of housing availability. Vermont legislators hear my voice. Um, whereas officials in cities I can't afford to be part of, like South Burlington, simply don't. Nathan Hoffman, he works on our marketing team. He asked, quote, how does a new Vermonter or new American find a home in Chittenden County? I was only able to find housing because my parents have lived there their entire lives and used their connections. Prices are outrageous and most places need a lot of work, unquote. Lucas Tremley, our production technician, said, I grew up in South Burlington. I just got a raise. I make good money, but I'm priced out of my own city. My life is a double whammy of student debt and unaffordable housing. I'm 35, and I only live here because I live with my mom. This is a well-known pro problem in South Burlington. Housing is a disaster, and I don't see it being fixed. Um, there are a lot of stories. I'm even going to skip the next one, unfortunately. This is a fellow from California and was shocked that housing in Burlington <coughs> is as expensive as Sonoma County. These are Vermonters who make nationally competitive wages, yet can't find affordable housing near our global headquarters in South Burlington. With low and middle market houses in extremely short supply, our team's been pushed to the outskirts of Chittenden County, and this shortage is holding them back from building their lives, and it's impacting our environment and it's slowing our economic growth. I wanna thank you all for the hard work you're doing working with Vermont communities. And I want you to know that South Burlington is a wonderful place to live. The state of Vermont is a wonderful place to live and OnLogic wants to help any way we can. You're welcome to come visit us uh, anytime. Thank you. <laughs> coming to visit. Yes, please do. We have great trip. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. And a sort of mid-course reminder that we will take written testimony and post it on our website, uh, oh, yeah. so and all. so we can hear all the stories as well. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we have Peter Plumo of South Burlington up next, and 
Um, we don't have Nicole Kesselring here yet. So after that would be Eric Stacy in person. Hi, Peter. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Plumo. Um, I'm from South Burlington, as was mentioned. And I, my comments, I think, are going to be a, a really nice adjunct to what you just heard from uh, the representative from OnLogic. Um, currently, I am an independent consultant in organizational change and service and product innovation. Um, I've lived in South Burlington for 23 years, specifically in the Southeast Quadrant. Um, and I'm very happy to be here to express my very strong support for the omnibus housing bill. My professional background is in infrastructure and economic development planning and consulting. And I've advised policymakers and private businesses across the country and around the world on these topics. In my opinion, this bill is an essential piece of helping remove local barriers to meeting Vermont's need to grow its labor force and to attract quality jobs by allowing the addition of much needed homes. From the perspective of employers, such as OnLogic, Particularly in those kinds of clean and green industries, Vermont wants to attract, retain, and grow. Proximity to qualified employees is almost universally cited as a critical factor in deciding where to locate. In other words, if they can't find the workers, they'll go elsewhere. Therefore, facilitating the development of housing that working families can afford with accessibility to quality jobs is essential to building Vermont's future. I think we can also, um, excuse me, I think we all also agree that we want our kids and their families to have a viable economic future here that doesn't require them to move out of state. However, according to an analysis by the Washington Post, Vermont annually loses 58% of our college graduates, which is the lowest rate of retention among all states. Certainly, increasing our stock of housing across all price points can only help improve the situation. Finally, as I'm sure you know, employers desire and need predictable and stable business environments to thrive and provide jobs. This bill will make zoning and building requirements more consistent and predictable across the state, thus making home building less costly and promoting economic <clears throat> development. In sum, by making it easier to build badly needed homes, this bill will help overcome a critical challenge to Vermont's future economic vitality. Thank you very much for your hard work on this important issue. Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Peter. <clears throat> so if we don't have Nicole, um, then next we'll go to Eric Stacy of Windsor. And after that is Gary Winslet. Good evening, representatives. Thank you for your time. I'm here to discuss eviction procedure and that the whole process takes at least eight months and costs landlords at minimum $12,000 per eviction. That's my repeated lived experience. It's in the details where the knife fight really happened. Per chapter 137 on residential rental agreements and in the case of an ejection for non-payment, the only statutory defense available to the tenant is non-habitability. In a no-cause ejection, or where the landlord has significantly increased the rent, the only defense available is that the landlord is retaliating against the tenant for actions taken in the previous 90 days. Now, when all this gets to court, most problems revolve around who did what and when. Again, from Chapter 137, and this is tedious, okay. actual notice is defined as receipt of written notice, hand-delivered or mailed to the last known address a rebuttable presumption that the notice was received three days after mailing is created if the sending party proves that the notice was sent by first class or certified mail. Now, anyone can drive a truck through that rebuttable presumption, and it's done frequently. Do you retrieve your certified letters? Also, there is absolutely no proof of delivery for that first class letter. So, I suggest the definition of actual notice be amended to replace first class and certified mail with priority mail, since priority mail comes with tracking. That way, everyone involved gets third party proof of receipt or not, and the problematic language of rebuttable presumption can go away. My bigger point here is that there is just not that much to adjudicate. Most evictions start having nothing to do with habitability or retaliation. 
But since these are the only available defenses that work, tenants attempt to add them after the fact, and quite frankly, at the suggestion of legal aid. But with verifiable notice, the next reform would be to require the tenant to show proof of said notice for a habitat habitability defense or supporting evidence for a retaliation defense at the rent escrow hearing. Please understand that at the rent escrow hearing, all stakeholders, the judge, the tenant, and the landlord are present. If the tenant shows that notice was sent and that the landlord might be a bad actor, then there's certainly reason for another hearing. But if there's no evidence to believe that there's anything to be adjudicated, then it is the tenant who is being the bad actor and possession of the property should be returned to the landlord. By the way, being a landlord in Vermont is what feeds my family and so sadly, the first thing I'm going to do with my multiple $12,000 losses is try and cost shift to my fellow good actor citizens, either by raising their rents if I can, or if not, by not fixing the nuisance issues. There are no saints in housing, but it is the service I provide. If the state creates conditions whereby I'm not getting paid, then I will be unable to continue to provide the service. And that is how we get back to the starting point of the downward spiral that we're all in. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you Eric. Um, we have Gary Winslet of South Burlington in person. We don't know if we have Pam the Ranger yet. So next after that would be Joe Gunter in person. Gary. Hi, my name is Gary Winslet. I'm an assistant professor of political science and international politics and economics at Middlebury College. Uh, my family, so my wife and my now four-year-old daughter and I moved to Vermont in August of 2019. Uh, we were really thrilled about it. We like winter, we like mountains, <laughs> we like the outdoors. Um, and, you know, after uh, starting in about 2021, we had what we thought would be a down payment together for a house. Uh, and we just, we've been on the housing market ever since and can't afford to buy. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as kind of like one of the young families that Vermont kind of wants, right? Like I'm a professor at Middlebury, my wife. Uh, she is a physician assistant in orthopedics in South Burlington. So we'd like to be fairly near where she works. Um, and there's just nothing reasonably priced near there, like at all. Um, houses that would be 300,000, 350, and a lot of comparable places are 600,000 or more near us. And we, we can't afford that. Um, we just, we can't. Um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of young families, you know, who have just left because it's too expensive to be here. And they don't come knock on your office door. They don't come yell at you. They don't show up to meetings. They just leave because it's too expensive. Um, and it's too expensive because we have extremely limited supply. And uh, the reason we have extremely limited supply is we've got some regulations that maybe had a lot of good intent behind them, but have a lot of unintended consequences. So we've got Act 250 at the state level, and we've got a lot of zoning at the local level. Now, again, I think there's some good intent behind these, but the problem is they're really, really easy to leverage by one, two, six people who just don't want to see anything change. Um, and it's across the board. It's in urban areas like Burlington. Um, you'll have people who don't want to see anything above two stories, even though it's like a major metro area um, that things revolve around. You'll have people in South Burlington who, you know, they want rural picturesque from their back deck, but they want to be five minutes to Trader Joe's. And so they object to housing near them. Um, you'll, you'll see it in, in rural areas as well. Um, it, this becomes a weapon in the hands of people who just don't want to see anything near them. And, and that creates the housing shortage, um, you know, and, and that's a problem. Um, and, and, you know, it, it affects everybody on down because then you get, don't get any filtering. When you don't build a new housing, my wife and I and, and our daughter and, you know, we, we may have another kid or taking in-laws, we can't buy a house. So the condo we currently rent, we're pricing somebody out. And we don't want to do that. That's not something that makes us feel good. Um, we want Vermont to be affordable to everybody. So we need more abundant housing. Not so that like Middlebury College professors can afford a house, but so that like Middlebury College janitors can afford a house. Like that's the people who really are on the sharp end of the housing shortage. And we have a shortage because we have these regulations that are just too easy to leverage um, by people who don't want to see change. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Gary. And we believe we have Cynthia back on the phone on Zoom. 
Cynthia, can you hear us? We need to hear her. I feel like I'm at a seance. <laughs> Hurry with us. <laughs> I like what's happening. Just a mute. Here. Hey. Am I there? Yes. Oh, yes. Your Am I there? Oh, yay. <laughs> hey. You can tell I didn't have to Zoom during the pandemic. <laughs> yes. We appreciate whatever barriers you face uh, together. Well, thank you for your indulgence. Uh, my name is Cynthia Haviland. I'm 64 years old. Um, I've lived in Vermont since 1989. And until March the 30th, um, I'm living in a friend's apartment while they're in Florida. But then beginning April 1st, I have no idea where I'm going to live. Uh, for the past 19 years, I've lived and raised my son in Richmond. However, near the 1st of November, my landlord showed up with a notice of termination for no cause from my apartment of over five years, where I have had a stellar record of tenancy, and I had to be out by December the 31st. I started looking for a one-bedroom apartment the day I got my notice of termination. And although I'd love to have a place where my son could still live with me part-time, a two-bedroom apartment is stratospherically out of my reach. Then I learned that there wouldn't even be an available uh, affordable one-bedroom apartment before I had to be out. So after the circus that's moving while working over Christmas, while breaking up uh, the, my 22-year-old family that was my child and myself, I finally got back to a permanent housing search just after New Year, and uh, for the first time in my life, and I never thought I would say this, I'm actually happy to be designated as a senior because it appears that subsidized senior housing is going to be my only option. Although, are you still there? Uh, although yeah. I lost a month of my temporary housing while trying to make sense with a master's degree of all the complex subsidy and senior housing whys and wheres, I'm now on all feasible wait lists in Chittenden County, but don't yet know if I'm even going to qualify for subsidy. I continue to look for apartments across many housing sites and through extensive word of mouth, and I'm not that picky. I don't want a mansion. I'd rather be living in something smaller, but I would like to be relatively near Richmond. It's the community that I've lived in in my life the longest. So my housing clock is ticking while I anxiously wait, and I can wait. But after hearing from Nancy from Cathedral Square, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but I've worked with all my ch with children all my life, so heck, I'll wait. But I have some questions, both real and rhetorical. Where am I supposed to live for possibly the next 12 to 60 months while I wait? I wonder while I wait if I will have to deplete my small savings that I reserved from leaving a domestically violent partner with my toddler years ago and use up my tiny pension I have coming from my underpaying career in education, all while paying for my belongings to be in storage. I wonder if I'm gonna to have to leave my son, my friends, my medical support system, my job, my hobbies, and move out of Vermont. And although I would never equate my current situation with someone who's defined as homeless by the Vermont subsidy guidelines, I do wonder if the definition needs to be revised. Perhaps our current definition isn't broad enough for the housing situation in Vermont at this juncture. Because although I'm staying in a house, I feel pretty homeless. And from how behind building new housing is, I have a feeling that unaffordable and unavailable is probably going to force me away from where I live. I thank the committee for their work, and now I wait. Thank you, so Cynthia. Thanks so much for your patience making it on with us. Um, we now turn to the miscellaneous set of categories that people wanted to testify under. And uh, Joe Gunter from Middletown Springs speaking, and then Maura Lane of Moortown Zoom after that. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you taking your time and doing these night meetings. I know they can be grueling. Uh, so my name is Joe Gunter. I live in Middletown Springs. I am the town manager in Fairhaven, Vermont. Uh, our last three speakers, I think, were an excellent segue to into what I wanted to talk about, today, which impacts my community, both Middletown and Fairhaven, uh, is a missile, missing middle income housing. Um, and in regards to that, I wanted to talk about the, I think it's S83, Senate Bill 83. This is the, the bill that will allow municipalities like mine to create 
project-based tax increment financing uh -huh. districts. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. So I'm going to call it project-based TIF or just TIF to, to shorten that up. Yeah, it's, it's too much. So, um, yeah, but it's great. It, it is great. So a lot like we just heard when my wife and I, we moved into the state five years ago, we had the exact same problem that the last three speakers had. Like, we're not poor, but we're also not rich. We didn't need low income housing. What we needed was less expensive housing. To move into the state to take my job, I had to liquidate 10 years worth of retirement just to buy a house. I'm the lucky one, right? Not everybody can do that. Like the young man said before, people will just leave. And that's what's happening to our workforce. People are just leaving. So let's talk about S83. Uh, the project allows for, for TIF districts to be established in municipalities uh, much like mine. By approving this bill, uh, the legislature would add a very powerful mechanism uh, to, to the development toolbox for our municipalities. It'll allow us, us municipalities to take control of our development dollars and stop this endless cycle of requesting federal grant funding. I had a housing development in my town uh, a gentleman, he had done the footwork. He came to me and said, Joe, I'm ready to build. I said, great, let's find a builder. I reached out. As soon as I said federal tax dollars, everybody stepped back from the table. These tax dollars have strings attached. My builders, they need to make money. It's just the truth of the matter. As soon as I say federal dollars, nobody wants to deal with me. It's too much to deal with. TIF, TIF, uh, TIF districts, however, um, leverage future tax money that municipalities like mine um, can use to, to make those, those construction projects um, more palatable, more profitable for these, for these construction companies. Uh, so I guess my major point, and I'm going to be oh, right on time. <laughs> uh, I, thought I'd be, I thought I'd be brief. Um, uh, the establishment of TIF districts, uh, S83, as it introduced, as it is introduced, is a great bill. However, it limits it limits those districts to affordable housing. What I'm asking is that restriction to be removed. My town, other towns need middle income housing, not just low income housing, as uh, per our VSAs. We need we need this to help Vermont escape this housing crisis. To help the gentleman uh, that spoke to me spoke before me move from his condo into his next home to create that wealth to improve his wealth. Um, and I guess that's what I had to say. Okay. okay. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Joe. Get the gold star for coming the farthest. <laughs> um, Maura Lane from Moortown on Zoom. And then after that, I believe Susan Aronoff is also on Zoom. Oh, she's in the room. Okay. Okay. Hi, Maura. You're muted. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, such moving stories I've been listening to. Um, you have a big problem with housing. My son, Philip Callum, is 42 years old. He has Down syndrome. He will never be able to live independently. The only option for him is shared living, which is essentially adult foster care. He has lived in two different homes in the past 20 years. Both of the families that he lived with were wonderful, and I was able to keep in contact with him. He was with one family for four years. The most recent family that he lived with, he lived with them for 10 years. They retired and moved to Florida. Philip is heartbroken, heartbroken about having to leave this family. This disruption in his life has left him depressed and anxious. I am hoping that in the future there would be service supported housing for people like Philip, where he could live with his peers, some place that he could call home, a place that he would not have to leave. He will very likely outlive us. It would be great if money could be appropriated towards housing for this very vulnerable population, people like Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Um, so Susan Aronoff here. In no, she's on Zoom. On this okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Susan Aronoff on Zoom. <laughs> 
No. No. It's not pretty word, though. Yeah. We look pretty bright on the screen. No, I know, but it's Oh, like, yeah, maybe that on there, sorry. <laughs> There we go. Hi, Susan. Hi, good evening. Um, first of all, thank you, Madam Chair and um, Mr. Chair. I think <laughs> the hearing that you're holding uh, this evening is just so important. And thank you to all the committee members who are hanging in there uh, this long. My name is Susan Aronoff. Um, I am a state employee. I'm testifying this evening on behalf of the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. For those who are not familiar with it, I would direct you to my written statement, just a brief overview in the interest of time. Um, I am the rare state employee whose position is entirely federally funded. I'm a creature of federal of a federal law, the um, Dis Developmental Disabilities of Rights Act. All 50 states have a council. We exist to bring the voice of the lived experience of people with developmental disabilities to you. I work for a council that's made up of 60% of people with um, disabilities or their family members. We have an annual policy platform. It has four items on it this year. Two of those items are housing items. The first is, oh my God, I'm um, so glad that I'm following the woman who's, who spoke before me. Um, I want to talk with you about shared living providers. Shared living providers provide housing to people with disabilities. They're funded by Medicaid. They work through our designated agencies, you know, like Howard Mental Health. In 30 days, March 17th, um, 2023, they're going to be under a new set of regulations. and. We already don't have enough shared living providers in the system. They really took a hit during COVID. They went from like having supports and services in the community for the people they were housing to being 24 seven support providers. And we need to really take care of our shared living providers. Um, I would like to see them, our, our proposal is to see them included in some of the newer um, housing programs so that people who need to make renovations on their homes um, to comply with the new rules can, and their housing people with disabilities can get funding to do that. We would, the set, that's one of our policy planks. The other is to please include housing for people with disabilities in all housing policies and programs. Um, you, you've been hearing about the shortage of housing for workers. Ima imagine if you were a worker with a disability. Imagine if you're someone with newly acquired disability and you want to age in place. That home access program that um, Patty Tedesco described is great, but it's very limited. We need more. Um, thank you. Thank you for your uh, service and for your support. Of, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I believe uh, we have a few people on Zoom coming up. Michael Monty of Burlington, and then David Fry and Michael Crancer. Michael. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the legislature, for your service to Vermont. Um, it's appreciated, really. I know and understand how much work it is to do the work you do and the difficult choices and issues that you had to face. I am the CEO of Champlain Housing Trust. We work here in Northwest Vermont to provide some services to the entire state through some mobile home lending and some other programs. Uh, as we work, in sh uh, uh, and I did provide some information, I think, to members of this committee, uh, the joint committee. Um, as we think about affordable housing and the need to address affordable housing, we never think of it as either or, but and and both. I think it's really important to understand that the, the range of points of view that you've heard tonight, which go, comes from dis people with disabil the developmental disabilities, to, to folks who are facing homelessness, our role really in a range of continuum. We think of it, of our work as a housing continuum of working from homelessness to rental housing to home ownership. And when we think of that, we think of the opportunities that we provide people to move from those, you know, from the streets into permanent affordable housing, rental housing, and to the opportunity that home ownership provides. 
when we think about these things, we think of those as, as homelessness, as providing people with safety. Safety. When we think of home ownership, we think about that as mobility and wealth building. When we think about rental housing, we think of it in terms of security, the ability to make sure that people are safe in, the, in those homes, secure in those homes, and have a rent and, a, and an owner that is going to make sure that they are not displaced. You heard testimony just recently about someone who is simply evicted. We don't do that unless there's serious cause for that. We provide permanently affordable housing. And I think I wanna say that that's a very important policy that the state of Vermont has and how critical it has been and how different that is from other states which don't do that. In other states where they're creating affordable housing where permanent affordability is not the policy, they lose as much affordable housing every year that the, as they gain. They actually take steps backwards as they create more affordable housing because there is a loss. That happened in Burlington, Vermont in the 80s or almost did with Northgate. But because of the Northgate experience where 330 families were going to be evicted from their homes because it wasn't permanently affordable, the state of Vermont created a policy that permanent affordability is a critical, important policy to follow. We follow that. And I think it's important for you to understand that that provides permanent security to people. The folks in our rental housing have the opportunity to move into home ownership or to move to other rental housing if they need to. Let me just say that in order to accomplish this, your generosity over the past couple of years has been enormous. It's been essential, it's been critical. And what I would ask you to do is to continue to provide funding for the creation of more housing, more programs for people who need homelessness, more who are in homelessness, more people so they can move into home ownership. And with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, you, Michael. Michael. Um, so we have David Fry and then Michael Cranter. On... Is, he, is he not here? Yeah, he's not here. Just watching Mike's face. And then unmuted. Oh, oh well, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Fry. Um, thank you for letting me come on tonight. And uh, thank you, everybody. I live in North, North Ferrisburg. My name is David Fry. Um, I'm the member of a of the Vermont Delva Del. Del Developmental Disability Council. I'm the I'm on their policy committee. Um, I'm going to share you some experience I've had with home care living providers. My first one that I moved in with, I didn't feel comfortable living there because I'm gay, and I really felt that that one didn't. Uh, ex they didn't. They just didn't. They, they didn't care about me because I was gay and I was pretty much sheltered and I pretty much left my door closed. The second one, I went to the case manager and I said, I really would like to live with two men because I'm gay. And, you know, I, I wanted that, that experiment with, with, with living two other gay men that, that were in the system. So they put me into that. And, you know, I went to work every single day. I work at Wake Robin. I've been there 15 years. And I came home and, you know, I would always have my door, door closed at, when I was gone. And they would go into my living quarters and telling me that, that I need to pick up my room or my bed, you know, was smelling or I went, came home one day and they gave me some token powder to put token powder in my shoes because my feet stunk. And, and so, and then I knew at the, the end that I just had enough of that home care provider. And then I went into somebody else's home and the boss was my case manager so there was a conflict of interest of keeping my ca my case manager i liked my case manager i had to i had to move on 
out of that home and then I lived with somebody and then now uh, I'm living on my own. So I just wanted to let you know that I like living on my own, but then during, during the pandemic, I'm not getting full services that I should be getting. I mean, having someone come to my home and, you know, like checking my bills or what's coming in the mail that I don't understand. And it, sometimes it's hard living on your own, but I'm doing it. Mm. Thank you, anyhow. Let me uh, testify. Thanks, Mr. Thank Fry. you. Thank you, David. It. Okay, we have Michael Crancer of Stowe. And if Matthew LaFleur is uh, on Zoom, he's on deck, but we don't believe we have him yet. Thank you, Michael. And you're muted. I'm not sure if you knew that. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm muted. Th thanks for uh, the opportunity to testify. I I've had a house in Stowe for 10 years. I split time between Stowe and the Philadelphia area. My mother-in-law has lived here for 40 years in Morrisville. My daughter lived down in Southern Vermont. My background is that uh, I was a lawyer. I was the chief environmental regulator of the state of Pennsylvania. I served in the governor's cabinet. I was judge and chief judge of the state environmental court. Uh, so I have some background in that. Um, what, what is the state of housing here in Vermont? Well, I think we've heard it's, it's really bad. It's terrible. It's kind of like if, it, if the state of housing were like, it's like Damar Hamlin, he's sitting there on the field in cardiac arrest. But more importantly, all these people who have testified are Damar Hamlin's and only you, the legislature can help. So what do I see as the elephant in the room? The elephant in the room is absentee short-term rentals. These are problems that have tentacles in every area we've heard tonight. Landlord abuse, and I'm not saying all landlords are bad, but we heard Cynthia Haviland's story well, I bet you donuts the dollar that landlord simply wanted to convert to short-term rentals for absentee owners. We have seniors in peril. We have homeless people in peril. We have rich versus poor because these absentee short-term renters buy houses, second, third, fourth. In Stowe, we have a guy who owns 16 of the houses and he's out of state. He's, he's out of country, actually. Um, so these are the problems that are driving the drying up of the working force. All of these other issues we've we've talked about today. And I have experience in this. In my neighborhood, I had to go to court and sue to shut down a party house in my quiet residential neighborhood. And I took that burden and I went to court and we won and we shut them down. It was an offense to our neighborhood. But these short-term rentals have tentacles, blood on their hands, and other problems, too. It's an environmental threat. They're always over-occupied. You know, the, the wastewater permits are for, say, 12 people. Well, they have 16, 18 people in there. Well, that's a groundwater disaster waiting to happen. You've got social justice inequality. You've got rich versus poor. We've heard about that tonight. These absentee owners conduct businesses with multiple houses, okay? We heard the professor, he can't even buy one house. These people buy multiple. The landlord abuse is over tenants. We've heard about that. They shove these long-term tenants out in order to have short-term rentals. And you're favoring the interests of out-of-staters because they're all out-of-staters, most of these people who own these places. And just ask Emily Kornheiser, your colleague, she had to introduce a bill because Massachusetts were coming, taking up housing in her district and preventing her people from getting housing. So we've already talked about... Um, the lack of availability of workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the elephant in the room, and this is a cross committee issue, is absentee owner conducting business as short-term rentals. And I thank you for your time. I have written testimony submitted and I have actual proposals that will ameliorate this problem. And I really wanna work with the legislature to get this problem solved, which will solve a lot of other problems. Thank, thank you, Mr. Krenzer. Thank you. So um, that, concludes everyone who we know is present who signed up to testify. Um, I'm pausing to see if anybody else has arrived. Uh, I've consulted with Chair Stevens and there are three additional people tonight who are here in person who have asked to testify and we agreed that we would allow that. Um, so thanks for nodding your heads in agreement as well. We know it's getting late. Um, so we have uh, Thomas Weiss of Montpelier.
upstairs. <laughs> Good evening. I am Thomas Weiss. I'm a civil engineer and my professional experience includes planning and design of wastewater and sewer systems, permitting and environmental reviews. And I truly thank you for squeezing me in at the very last minute to speak to you here this evening. Uh, as you are aware, a housing bill doesn't and cannot stand alone. Uh, other concepts that support sustainable, affordable housing should be integrated into any bill. Food security, child care, on-site treatment of wastewater, reducing Vermont's carbon footprint, and more. Today, I present seven recommendations for your consideration. First, require that new housing does not add to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Senate Natural Resources and Energy is working on a bill uh, about reducing thermal loads. And uh, you can either support that effort by, by possibly putting something into your bill on thermal loads or, or at least coordinating and understanding what they're doing and how these 40,000 new housing units are going to uh, affect thermal loads. And the stretch code and commercial uh, building energy standards are inadequate to reduce those thermal loads by the levels we'll need to do to, to meet the, the state law. Uh, retain existing Act 250 jurisdiction over priority housing projects. Perhaps 80,000 to 100,000 people could reside in the 40,000 units that are being talked about. Uh, representing a 15% increase in population, and that potential growth exceeds that of Vermont's highest growth decades, which were 1960 to 1980. So permitting for these units needs to be comprehensive and robust. Act 250 does that. Other permits, zoning and state permits, do not provide a comprehensive review. And collectively, these other permits do not address many of the Act 250 criteria. Expand Act 250 jurisdiction outside the Chapter 76A designations. The projection of 40,000 units is something like a quadrupling of the rate of recent housing construction. Even if 30,000 units go into the compact areas, that leaves 10,000 new units in the rural countryside, which means no reduction of the pressure on the rural countryside. Retain state and over, oversight and connections to municipal water and wastewater systems. I looked into this in 2021. Those permits would not, if they weren't required, would not decrease overall permitting time because of the other permits needed. The permit fee has a median cost of $175 per housing unit. Not much, but it is something. And the state oversight has benefits. Uh, number five, present. Mr. Weiss, we just probably need your concluding thoughts at this right, point. Right, I've got two more sentences though. Okay. <laughs> Prevent the isolation zones of water and sewer systems from encroaching on a neighbor's property where municipal water and sewer are not available and provide access to sunlight for gardens. Sunlight, okay. I think we can do that. Um, <laughs> and I can God, provide something in more detail to both committees. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, based on what I told you. So thank thank you. you very much for allowing me Back. to testify this or speak this evening. Thank you for coming in. Sorry, <laughs> that's the best. Um, and we have Stephen Whitaker of Montpelier. Want to keep us uh, focused on housing? <laughs> thank you for fitting me in, Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I want to close on a note that seems to get lost for years. I've been working on behalf of the unhoused and the marginally housed in and around Montpelier. We still have today people sleeping in <laughs> stairways, in cars, in basements, in churches with or without permission and in vestibules of commercial buildings. Uh, there are people that don't fit into the warehousing in the hotels program. I have attempted and done extensive research. It is within reach to do, to build, quickly build 
interim dignified shelter. There's a thing designed in Oregon called Conestoga huts. They're private lockable soft shelters that folks can live in for about 8,000 bucks a year. You would walk to a common trailer for toilets or showers. But th those clusters of that type of housing is what this emergency requires. That it's gonna take years to develop these thousands of units that we're talking about. We need shelter now. And especially if the housing, the hotel program, I, I agree with, I commend Thomas Weiss for his thoughtful, he, he, he's done good work here in Montpelier at keeping the council's feet to the fire. So in effect, look at a variation, boxable, spelled B-O-X-A-B-L. Those are accessory dwelling units made, manufactured, pre-fitted fixtures, everything. They can be trucked in on a trailer and unfolded and occupied within a day. Uh, brilliant design. We, we should see about franchising and manufacturing some of those here. So in effect, we, oh, pardon, pardon me. Yeah. We can designate, identify, put a priority on identifying the areas in town, in each town where six or 10 units. I don't advocate the uh, internment camp uh, in Burlington, that model of, uh, you know, pods look like jail cells and they remind me of the, the Japanese internment camps. That's not dignified shelter. We, we really need to, there's another model out of Europe that are nice colored cylinders. Uh, the, anyway, there's a lot of information available. I've, I've reached out to Chairman uh, Stevens. Um, walking distance is important. Identify the sites for small clusters. Have site managers paid even some of the unhoused folks can become site managers, pay $25 an hour to stay up all night. And these site managers can coordinate and make sure you've got a creative group of people occupying each cluster so that you're not putting the heroin dealers and the junkies in the same shelter or all the drunks in, in the same shelter. Thank you, Mr. Ritter. Could you have a concluding thought? Or I think I'm happy to provide it in more organized fashion if I get another opportunity, but I think this is within reach within months, and we should have used ARPA money to buy those toilet and sh shower trailers. They can help in our disaster preparedness as well. And I just want us to be really careful about invoking internment camps and people's extreme loss of freedom when we talk about trying to shelter the unhoused. I just want to say that, but thank you, Mr. Whitaker. Our last uh, speaker tonight is Samantha Warren. Oh, Samantha from Warren. I'm sorry. You were looking at me funny. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, I didn't even know about this. It's actually, somebody told me about it. So Thanks for making it out for me. Yeah, I actually really wanted to um, speak with, um, you started the clock, so never mind. I'm going to read the email. Sorry, what? I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, this may, I may be a little unpopular, um, but this is my not so happy story about being in tax credit housing. Um, but, you know, hopefully it could be used to be turned around and um, something come out of it um, to make things better all around for everyone um, who lives in affordable housing. So um, I'm originally from Vermont. I grew up in Warren. I um, went to college. I moved out to Seattle, lived there for a long time, came back when my mom was terminally ill. Um, I also, around the same time, developed a physical illness, part of Lyme disease and the Lyme bill when I was here back then. Um, uh, my income took a plunge, uh, ended up in, uh, you know, thankfully affordable housing, so I had a roof over my head. Um, sometimes I question whether or not I want to I'd rather be camping and right in the dead of winter. No, I'm, I'm glad I have housing. But so I'm writing. I'm just going to read this. I'm writing to um, express several concerns regarding affordable housing. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, I don't need to repeat the obvious fact that there is a lack of available affordable housing in Vermont. What I want to share is my personal experience renting in Vermont, especially my experience in affordable tax credit housing. It has been an eye opener. 
While I appreciate that I do have housing I can currently afford, it has come at a significant cost to me. Many times I feel it has not been worth it and I have been even considered living out of my car, in essence, becoming homeless. Living in affordable tax credit housing, I have been a victim of crime committed by a few tenants who have repeatedly threatened to kill and harm myself and other tenants. I personally have been threatened with being beaten, killed, raped, and been the recipient of ongoing harassment and bullying. One tenant has on numerous occasions attempted to break into my apartment in a volatile, drunken rage. I've had my property destroyed. I've had tires. I don't know if anyone purposely did that or not, but I, I've almost had a hammer lodged in my head by the same violent neighbor. Uh, as for, uh, gosh, where'd you go? <laughs> the same violent neighbor for building a porch privacy barrier so they, I couldn't be, so because they're trying to not be seen going and coming. Um, I have had to resort to placing a no stocking order. I've never done that before, which has been violated over 17 times. The police didn't come out all those times though. So the judge wow. thought she generally complied. But I have also been witnessed rampant alcohol use and illicit drug use, drug dealing and illegal firearm use. I do not feel safe in my home. I do not have peaceful enjoyment. Being a victim of this type of behavior has had some significant emotional impact. I suffer nightmares and PTSD symptoms. I have lost time from work and other work and life opportunities. I have lost too much of time out of my life contending with these housing issues. I've looked for other housing, but it has been extremely difficult. I do not wish to live in affordable tax credit housing or subsidized housing again, because I'm afraid. I have spoken with numerous people, because this is what I do, who had lived in various affordable housing complexes run by different housing agencies, and I hear similar horror stories. These tenants live in fear. They have suffered trauma. They do not feel safe. They're not happy. You, you know, with their living situation. Yes, they have a roof over their head, and yes, that is a good thing. But again, there is a cost. It is not contributing to living a productive life. It ends up eroding your life. The management company eventually, after two years, attempted to evict one of the tenants, and they failed to evict them, citing that it was too difficult in Vermont to evict people. I have video and audio documentation, so I find this bewildering. Due to these experiences, I have two concerns. The, sorry, oh, the first is that it has become too hard to evict bad tenants, both for landlords and for the physical and mental well being of other tenants who have to live near them. The second is that while I believe that everyone should have opportunity for housing and appreciate the initiative to home the homeless, I feel many homeless are not ready to be housed in the community housing. Housing the homeless who have significant drug addiction, who exhibit disruptive behaviors and mental health issues creates very unhealthy conditions for those also who live near them. I believe there needs to be more transitional housing and social services to address these issues. This would also be housing for tenants with significant behavior problems, people who already live in housing. Um, and, and some type of housing for these people with behavioral problems and those who commit crimes against others. Thank you for hearing my concerns. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that completes our list and the folks who have come and, and offered their time. I would like to really, um, on, the, on behalf of the General Housing Committee in the House, um, I'd just like to thank everybody who came out um, including the people who stayed home at Zoom and, and shared their stories with us, um, and folks who came here to, to this room um, building tonight. I can't tell you how much it means to hear um, stories like Samantha's. And, you know, it, it is not what we seek to do, but, um, but it is real to, uh, for you and for your neighbors. And so I appreciate you having the courage to come down sharing your story with us tonight and we will um our committee will be starting work on a housing bill um starting next week 
Um, so we'll be following the Senate's lead on some of the housing issues that we talked about tonight. But I would also just like to thank the staff who helped us set this up tonight and has worked as long as, as uh, longer than we have today, because I think we got a break. Um, Mike Ferrant and Scott Moore and, and Ron Wilds and, and Amelia Gillen and we have Lori Morse and and Peggy Delaney downstairs who helped us all get up here. And I would just like to thank them for, for hosting. Um, yeah. But again, most importantly, from our perspective, thanks to the witnesses who came to share their stories with us tonight. Yeah, I just, um, I'd like to echo uh, those thanks and um, speak to uh, our process a little bit. First, I, I do want to thank our counterparts in the house. Uh, I want to thank my committee. We've been living and breathing this housing bill since uh, the session started. Um, this has been really illuminating and helpful tonight, and we'll probably add a little bit more dimension to our work that we hope to conclude next week um, with a vote. So this can go on to the other committees of jurisdiction and over to the House. But we, in our final deliberations, have thought of pieces that we might pass over <laughs> to the House um, you know, to to get your work on it, since we really took on exclusionary zoning and uh, that has taken up a lot of our time. But uh, we're really grateful to hear that the House is going to work on supportive housing, recovery housing, landlord tenant issues. Um, some of the things that folks may have spoken to tonight that they might not see reflected as deeply in our bill, but hopefully will be part of uh, the final product between both of our committees. Um, we have a lot of people who submitted written testimony who are who were here tonight, who were not here tonight. I want to thank Scott, our committee assistant. I think you put at least 50 new uh, written submissions onto our website that we hope will be of benefit to you all and other legislators as this work continues. Um, you know, finally, in, in our thanks to everyone who testified, um, often in our committee, we've said that the most voiceless in this process are the unhoused. They're not voting in these communities right now. They're not necessarily at every planning commission or select board meeting because they are sleeping in cars. They are precariously housed. They are in motels. They are not in our state yet. They are children. Um, and, you know, this has been really valuable because we've heard more of those voices. And we know that we've also heard from organizations that do their best to bring those voices to us when those folks can't be present themselves. It takes immense bravery to share some of the stories that were shared tonight. And we deeply appreciate people's courage and willingness uh, to go on this journey to alleviate our housing crisis and make sure everyone in Vermont has a home. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope everyone gets some rest now.